Welcome to Chapter 10, The Digital Abstraction. Let us ask a few preliminary questions. You may have heard several times the expression that computers use only zeros and one. What is the justification for this expression? Can you explain the following anomaly? The design of an adder is a simple task. You want to design a circuit, a digital circuit, that receives two strings and outputs the string that represents their sum. That is relatively a simple task. However, the de design and analysis of a single electronic device, here we have a device that has two transistors, is a complex task. So, the issue is that we have digital circuits, and in reality, these digital circuits are implemented by analog devices. So let's try to ex explain and understand the differences between a digital circuit and an analog device. So a digital circuit works over the values 0 and 1. Um, the description of the digital circuit is rather simple. It is uh, often specified by a Boolean function. And of course, this is an abstract model uh, which needs to be justified. How, it, how does it relate to reality? An analog device, on the other hand, you measure the voltages in the device in different locations. These voltages are real numbers. The description of an analog device is rather complicated and is often modeled by differential equations. And this description is supposed to be real, this is rather than an abstract model. So the advantage of using an abstraction is that it is easier than the more realistic, complete, complicated analog model. So I spoke about, I mentioned the term analog device. What does it mean? In what way does a di digital circuit model an analog device? Can every analog device be modeled as a digital circuit? What type of digital circuits are we interested in? And once we have these digital circuits, can we compare them? Suppose I have two implementers, two implementations of inverters. What makes one inverter better than the other? How can we tell if an analog device is a gate, say an inverter. So we want to understand these questions. OK, the basic building block of computers are transistors. So you have a computer. What You build the computer from what is known as VLSI chips. VLSI chips are built from gates and flip-flops, and gates and flip-flops are built from transistors. So the transistors are the basic building blocks from which you build the whole system. Okay. The most common VLSI technology is called CMOS. Okay. What does that mean? VLSI stands for Very Large Scale Integration, which means, in other words, many, many millions and even billions of transistors placed on one small chip. CMOS is a technology of transistors which uses two types of transistors. One is called NMOS and the other one is called PMOS. NMOS, NMOS transistor, in short, is an N transistor. PMOS transistor, in short, is a P transistor. So in CMOS technology, you have just two types of transistors from which you build the whole system. Let's try to understand what these transistors are about. So this is a just a diagram, an abstract diagram that describes an N transistor, and this is a diagram for the P transistor. Okay, so let's try to understand what do we have here in this diagram. We have a device. This is our device. And the device has, sorry, and the device has three uh, pins. These are how you connect to the device. One pin is called the gate, 
the other pin is called the source, and the third pin is called the drain. In a P-transistor, the situation is the same. Notice that we, when we want to depict a P-transistor, we put this small circle in the gate. This small circuit does not appear in the N-transistor. Notice also that it is not by mistake that the source of the N-transistor appears in the bottom, and the source of the P-transistor appears in the top, and the drain here appears in the top, the drain here appears in the bottom. So both transistors have three pins. These pins are the gate, the source, and the drain. Physically speaking, you uh, would think of the source and the drain as completely symmetric. However, it is useful to think of the source as an input and the drain as an output. Although, physically speaking, this is not true at all. Okay? Good. So let's try to explain how these transistors function. Okay? So, we're talking about an N-transistor now. The functionality of the N-transistor is as follows. You measure the voltage at the gate. This is what is written here. V of the gate means the voltage of the gate. If the voltage of the gate is high, and we, I will explain later what I mean by high. Let's keep it very vague at this point. If the voltage of the gate is high, then the resistance between the drain and the source becomes very low. Let's call it a zero. Now, the minute you have two points, the resistance between them is very low, we know that they have the same voltage. So let's assume that the source is an input, the drain is an output, then in this case, the voltage of the drain is determined by the voltage of the source. And that's why I have this assignment over here, which says the voltage of the drain gets the value of the voltage of the source. What happens if the voltage on the gate is low? If the voltage on the gate is low, then the resistance between the drain and the source in the end transistor is very high. We say it is infinite. That would mean that the voltage of the drain is not determined by the voltage of the source because there's a very high resistance between them. Now, this story that I just told you about the functionality of the end transistor holds if the voltage of the source is low. This is why I wrote the source here in the bottom, to emphasize that the voltage of the source is low. Okay. If the voltage of the source is not low, then this description is not very useful. Okay. So you see here, we have two, so to speak, states. One is when the gate is, has a high voltage, and the other when the gate has a low voltage. If the gate has a high voltage, the resistance between the drain and the source is very low, we say it's zero, in which case we often say the transistor is on or in a conducting state. If the voltage of the gate is low, then the resistance between the drain and the source is very high. In this case, we say that the transistor is disconnected or off. Now let's describe the functionality of a P-transistor. In the P-transistor, if the voltage of the gate is high, then the resistance between the source and the drain is infinite. And if the voltage of the gate is low, then the resistance between the source and the drain of the P-transistor is zero. Now this story holds if the voltage of the source of the P-transistor is high. And this is why I depicted the source on the top. So here we assume that the voltage of the source is low, and here we assume that the voltage of the source is high. A little bit of terminology. Let Vg denote the voltage of the gate. Rsd denote the resistance between the source and the, and the drain of the transistor. 
R sub SD superscript N of VG is the resistance between the source and the drain in an n-type transistor as a function of the voltage of the gate. And similarly, we define RSD superscript P of VG in a P-transistor. And now we have two voltages, V low and V high. These are thresholds that determine what, what it means that the gate is low and the gate is high. And of course, the actual values of low and high depend on the technology at hand. So we're not interested in the actual numbers, we're interested in the concept. So the simplified behavior of a transistor is as follows. If it's an n-type transistor, you look at the voltage of the gate, and if the voltage of the gate is low, the resistance is infinite. If the voltage of the gate is high, the resistance is zero. And in a p-transistor, we have the dual situation. If the voltage of the gate is low, the resistance is zero. If the voltage of the gate is high, the resistance is infinite. Now, in reality, of course, zero resistance means very small resistance, and infinite resistance simply means very high resistance. Okay. Now, as the uh, circuit, uh, as time proceeds, we uh, are interested in what is the state of the transistor. Is it on? Is it off? Is it conducting? Is it not conducting? Now, the voltages in an electronic circuit may change over time, in particular if the circuit is engaged in some computation. So we distinguish between two cases, or the changes, the transitions, that are supposed to be fast or transient, and the periods between the transitions that are called the steady state. Okay. So if you look at a voltage at a certain point of time, it may change. This change is supposed to occur quickly, and then it's supposed to stabilize on some value for a relatively long amount of time. Let's see an example. Suppose I have two players which are playing with a ball, X and Y, and they're passing the ball to each other. So we can regard the time that the ball travels from one player to another as a transition as a transient state. And we can regard the state of the ball as steady if one of the players is holding the ball. And then we say that the ball alternates between the states x and y, between being in the hands of player x and being in the hands of y. And we would regard these two states to be the stable states or the steady states. And the transitions where the ball is flying from x to y or from y to x is supposed to be quick and it's supposed to be a transient state, something that does not last for a long time. Okay, so the steady state of the transistor is that if the voltage of the gate is high, then the resistance between the source and the drain is zero. Now we're talking about an n-type transistor. Of course, um, if this is the case, then the voltage of the drain becomes the voltage of the source. And recall that we assume that for N transistors, the voltage of the source is low, so the voltage of the drain would also be low. If the voltage of the gate is low, then the resistance of the transistor is high, infinite, and then therefore the voltage of the drain is unchanged by the transistor. Something else is supposed to determine the voltage of the drain. Okay? In a P transistor, the behavior is in a dual manner. If the voltage of the gate is high, the resistance is infinite. If the voltage of the gate is low, the resistance of the transistor is zero. Okay, so this description of the behavior of an N transistor and a P transistor implies that the behavior is highly nonlinear. What do I mean by nonlinear? Recall that a function f of x is said to be a linear function if it satisfies f of a times x equals a times f of x. Okay, this is linearity of functions. Good. So let's look at the following graph. The x-axis is the voltage of the gate. The y-axis is the resistance between the source and the drain of the transistor. And we have two types of transistors, red N-type P, sorry, green P-type.
in the, let's start with the end type. In the end type, if the voltage of the gate is low, then the resistance is very high. As the voltage of the gate increases, the resistance decreases. But it doesn't decrease in a linear fashion. It decreases very quickly and then stays low. In a p-type transistor, as the voltage of the gate increases, suddenly the resistance between the source and the drain increase substantially. So we could think of this voltage, for example, as V low, and this voltage, for example, as V high. Okay. So the minute the resistance is, say, above 40, we consider it to be infinite. The minute the resistance is, say, below 5, we consider it to be very small. Okay? Just to get a feeling of what's happening here. Usually the ratios are even bigger between the high resistance and the low resistance. Okay. So now we have a description of uh, the functionality of an N transistor, the functionality of a P transistor. Let's look at the following uh, circuit. I connect the source of the N transistor to zero volts. I connect the source of the P transistor to five volts. I connect the drain of the P transistor to the drain of the N transistor, and from there I draw my output. Both the gates are fed by the same wire, which I call the input. Okay? Now I claim that this circuit, which has two transistors, an N transistor and a P transistor, is an inverter. Let's try to understand why. Okay, so we consider two cases. Either the voltage of the input is low, or the voltage of the input is high. Okay. If the voltage of the input is low, then the P transistor is in conducting state, and the N transistor is not conducting, it's off. Okay, so this is what we have here. N is low, the P transistor has zero resistance, the N transistor has infinite resistance. And this is my output, and my output is connected via a zero resistance resistor to 5 volts. Therefore, in the steady state, the voltage here is going to be 5 volts. Now let's look at the case in which the input is high. If the input is high, the P transistor is not conducting, the N transistor is conducting. So this is the gate of the P transistor and of the N transistor. The P transistor is not conducting, the N transistor is conducting, zero resistance, so my output is connected with zero resistance to zero volts, and therefore the voltage here is going to be zero volts. Let's conclude. If the input is low, the output is high. If the input is high, the output is low. So this is an inverter. It inverts the value from zero to one and from one to zero, from high to low and from low to high. Now, the analysis which I just suggested is a qualitative an analysis. It gives a general idea of how an inverter works, and we have no idea about the actual voltages of the output as, for the, uh, as a function of the input voltage, what happens if the voltage is a little bit higher or a, bit, a little bit lower. We don't know what is going to be the voltage of the output. And we, in fact, don't have any idea how long it takes the output to stabilize. Compare this qualitative analysis with a quantitative analysis in which you have a precise modeling of a transistor, you compute the precise input-output relationship, and doing all of that would require a lot of work, which is usually done with the aid of a computer program called SPICE. So our goal here is to focus on the qualitative analysis. Okay, let's try to see the relationship between the analog and digital world. An analog signal is just a real function from R to R, where the domain refers to time and the range refers to voltages. Okay, so this is usually time. 
and this is usually voltage. Now, let's make a simplifying assumption. Let's assume that the wires in our circuits have zero resistance, zero capacity, and signals propagate through the wires without any delay. So if I have a very long wire, and I measure the voltage here, let's call it F of T, and I measure the voltage here, let's call it G of T, then because the wire has zero resistance and zero capacity, we will assume, for simplicity, that F of T equals G of T at all times. This is, of course, not true in reality, but let's make this simplifying assumption. Okay, so voltage along a wire is identical at all times. Okay, now this signal is the voltage. The voltage is the der derivative of the energy as a function of charge. So, you know, if you're not uh, using any qu quantum physics, you can regard a signal as a continuum, continuous function. Okay, a digital signal, on the other hand, is a function whose domain is, again, time. Here the R stands for time again. But the, but the range is not the set of real numbers, but only three, possib three possibilities. It's a zero, a one, or non-logical. So G of T describes the logical vary, va value carried by a wire as a function of time. And 0 and 1 are what we call logical values. And the non-logical tells us it's we don't know if it's a 0 or 1. And therefore, we're stuck. Now, we would like the value of g of t to be non-logical. We would want this to be a rare event. Not only rare, but short. I would emphasize short transient in the steady state we want the value of g to be logical to be either zero or one okay so now we have an analog signal and we want to treat it as if it's a digital signal so the naive answer is just set a threshold v prime and if f of t is less than v prime, you say that the digital interpretation of f of t is zero. If f of t is greater than v prime, you say that the digital interpretation of f of t is one. Okay? Now, this is a valid definition. The question is whether it's useful, whether we can build systems that will work based on this definition. Okay, so let's see what are the problems. First problem, if we have a circuit that has many, many devices in it, all of them must use exactly the same threshold V prime. Now, in practice, when you have, uh, when you're producing devices in a circuit, they're not going to be identical. You're going to have some differences between them, and these differences will mean that they will not be able to follow the same threshold. Okay? Moreover, if I have small changes in the value of F of T, which is called, what is called perturbations, around the threshold, then I will get unexpected values for the digital interpretation of F of T. Let's see an example. So suppose I want to measure the weight of uh, a rock by connecting it to a spring. So this is my rock. It says uh, weight W. I connect it to a string, to a spring, and I look at how long the spring becomes, and I Let's denote the length of the spring as by L. And we know that uh, L is linearly related to W. This is the behavior of the spring. Now, we want to know whether W is greater than W prime. So all you need to do is you need to check whether the length of the spring, L, is greater than L prime. Okay. So what happens when we put this, uh, when we connect the rock to the spring okay, over time? So look here. We have a graph, the x-axis is, sorry, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is the length of the spring. Uh, I start with the spring without uh, the weight connected to it. I connect the weight, the length increases, 
I, uh, and then the and then the spring oscillates it goes becomes a little bit longer a little bit shorter and there's a dampening effect in this oscillation okay and I want to compare the length of the spring with L prime so I wrote here in blue the length L prime and you see I begin with a length which is less than L prime I go above L prime then I go below above below above and it it means that it takes me time until I can decide whether the weight of the rock which is expressed by the length of the spring is greater than L prime which would mean that the weight of the rock is greater than W prime okay the closer W is to W prime the longer it will take me to do this decision because the oscillations will take me above and below the threshold L prime. So we see that using a single threshold creates problems in measuring and making a binary decision of zero versus one. So let's use separate thresholds. Let's see what I mean by that. So I will have two thresholds, low and high, V low and V high, and given a digital signal, sorry, given an analog signal F of t, I define the digital interpretation of F of t as follows. If F of t is less than V low, the digital interpretation is zero. If it's greater than V high, the digital interpretation is one. And if it's in between, I'll say that the digital interpretation is non-logical. So if I go back to the previous example, I will set through two thresholds, low and high. And because W is very close to some threshold, which is between the high and the low, I'm oscillating here in the non-logical area. And I'm just giving up in this case. If I were to have a stone which is very heavy, it would go above the blue line and remain there even though it oscillates. If I were to start with a weight which is less than the low weight, then this, the spring would lengthen, but it would always remain below the red line, and I would not have this inability to make a decision. Okay? So what we see here in the time act, this is the time axis, this is the voltage axis. We have two thresholds, low and high. I have an analog signal. And whenever the analog signal is in this region, its digital interpretation is a zero. Whenever it's in this region, the, its digital interpretation is a one. And in between, it is non-logical. OK, so the question is, did we solve the problem of a single threshold by introducing two thresholds? Okay, so let's see. We had, two, we had a manufacturing problem of tolerances in the manufacturing. So all the devices should be such that a low output must be less than V low, a high output must be greater than V high. And then if you have fluctuations of F of T around V low, you're still in trouble because you will fluctuate between zero and non-logical. However, this is not as bad as fluctuating between zero and one. Because when I hear a one, I think that I'm sure about something. And when I hear non-logical, I know that actually I cannot decide yet. Okay, so let's try to define an inverter. An inverter is a device... That's that when given input in of t gives us output out of t such that the digital interpretation of out of t is zero if the digital in interpretation of in of t is one. The digital interpretation of out of t is one if the digital interpretation of in of t is zero. And if the digital interpretation of in of t is non-logical, then the inverter can output whatever it wants. We don't care. Okay, is this a good definition? Can we build a circuit, a digital circuit, based on this definition? We will see that 
in fact, this definition is useless, and that the one of the causes for the failure of this definition in practice is noise. But before I, I talk about noise, I need to introduce transfer functions. Okay, so what is a transfer function? A transfer function is a function that describes the relation between the voltage at an output of a gate and the voltages of the inputs of the gate. Okay, for example, if I have an inverter with input x and output y, the value of the output at time t prime is a function of x of t throughout the interval from minus infinity till t prime. Okay? Now, we say that the device has a static transfer function if the input x of t is stable for a sufficiently long time, and say equals x0, then the output y of t stabilizes on the value y0, that is f of x0. So y of t equals f of x0. Now, you notice that here I looked at the whole history up to time t prime. And in the static definition of a transfer function, I'm ignoring the history. I'm only requesting that the input is stable for a sufficiently long period of time. And then the output behaves according to f, to the transfer function. So we have here an issue of history versus presence. If the device does not have a static function, that it is not a logical gate, it might still be useful. For example, it could be used as a memory device or an oscillator. A memory device is a device that remembers a bit. So I tell it, please remember the bit zero, and then it outputs a zero until I ask it to do something else, regardless of the input. An oscillator is a device that continuously changes its output. Okay. Okay, so formally speaking, the function f is a static function of a device g if the input at time t equals x0 implies that the output at time t0 sorry this should be yeah it's okay. The output let's start with output at time t. If x of t is x0, then y of t is f of x0. Now look here, the definition is a little bit more complicated, okay, because this is a physical device. So first of all, we require that x of t be x0 throughout an interval of length big delta. Okay? This is big, this big delta. Good. So we want the input to be stable during an interval. Moreover, if the input is stable from time t0 minus delta till time t0, then at time t0, the output of the gate is indeed f of x0, which is the value of the input during this interval. We refer to this delta as a propagation delay because it models the time required for the output to stabilize on the correct value. Okay? Now, a device is a gate if it has a static transfer function. Now, a gate might not be a logical gate. Okay? This is a... Um, don't want to confuse you here to think that whenever I say a gate, I mean a logical gate. No, it's just a device that has a static transfer function. Okay. A few remarks. Uh, usually our circuits operate over a bounded range of voltages. And therefore, when we talk about static transfer functions, we usually def deal only with bounded domains, say, 0 to 5 volts. Okay, that's the first remark. Second remark, we cannot expect x of t and, and y of t to be completely stable. So what we would want x of t to be roughly x0 and y of t to be roughly f of x0. And we uh, express this by saying that the absolute difference between xt and x0 is bounded by delta, and the absolute value of the difference between y of t and f of x0 is bounded by epsilon. Second thing is, it takes time the out for the output 
to resemble the output which it's supposed to be equal to. So if the input is stable from time t1 till time t2, roughly stable on the value x0, then after delta units of time from the beginning of the interval, you expect the output to be roughly equal to what it's supposed to be. Okay, so delta measures the stability of the input, epsilon measures the stability of the output. T1, T2 is the interval during which x of t is delta stable, and T1 plus delta until time T2 is the interval during which yt is epsilon stable. Okay? The third remark is that usually when we look at x0, we're interested in values of x0 such that the digital interpretation of x0 is 0 or 1, namely it's logical. We don't want x of t to be not logical, because if x of t is not logical, we don't care what the output is. Okay, so back to the definition of an inverter. So we said that an inverter is a gate whose static transfer function satisfies the following. Okay, you look at the input x, and you look at the output f of x. If the interpretation of the input is 1, then f of x should be, the digital interpretation of f of x should be 0. If the digital interpretation of x is 0, the digital interpretation of f of x should be 1. And, um, well, if the input x is non-logical, you can output anything you want. And you could use this type of definition to define any other gate you wish, like an OR gate, an AND gate, and so on. Good. So I promise to explain the problem that noise introduces. What is noise? Noise is undesired changes to your signal f of t. If I go back to the example of the weight hanging from a spring, so I have a spring to which I connect my weight, and now I have some wind, then the wind will cause my weight to fluctuate and it will make it difficult for me to measure the length of the spring. Okay, So in this case, wind would cause noise because the length of the spring is not, does not depend only on the weight of the stone, it also depends on the force which the wind exerts on the stone. Okay, so suppose I have a signal A of t, and then I have a wire that connects me to some point, and I call it B, and I measure the voltage at point B, and I call it B of t. So A of t is the voltage in the beginning of the wire, B of t is the voltage in the end of the wire, and as we said before, we assume that the wires have zero resistance, zero capacitance, etc., Therefore, we expected A of t to be exactly equal to B of t. Well, in fact, there's going to be a difference, and this difference is called the noise. Okay, so we have a noise signal, let's call it N of t, or N sub B of t, which describes the, or equals, the difference between B of t and A of t. And you may ask, what would cause the noise? Why would this signal be different than zero? The main source of noise in electrical circuits is heat. What is heat? Heat is kinetic energy of electrons. The atoms in a wire are confined, they cannot really move. It is the electrons that, as a result of the heat, start moving around in random ways. And these random ways do not perfectly cancel each other, and therefore you get random currents along this wire. And these random currents create perturbations of the voltage. And this is what we measure as the difference between the voltage B of t and the voltage A of t. This is the noise. Okay, so now let's assume that the noise is bounded. So in the bounded noise model, the noise signal along every wire has a bounded absolute value. There exists some epsilon, such that the, at every point of time, the value of the noise is bounded by 
epsilon. What is the justification for the bounded noise model? The justification is that the noise is a result of these random imbalances in the movement of the electrons due to heat. And these random imbalances have a distribution with a rapidly diminishing tail. That means that if epsilon is not too small, then the probability of the noise exceeding epsilon is very, very small, so small that we will consider it to be zero. Okay. So now let's see what we can do with noise. Okay, so what we have here is a circuit which is built by connecting two inverters in, in series. So this is inverter 1, and this is inverter 2. Inverter 1 has input x, output y. Inverter 2 has input y, output z. Okay? So I just connect connected two inverters in a cascade. Okay? Assume that the input for the first inverter is high. Okay? So x, the voltage of x is greater than v high. That means that y is low. Okay, we have no idea how low y is going to be, so let's assume that y equals the voltage of y is v low minus some epsilon prime, for a very small epsilon prime. This would be legal. I have a high output, I have a, low, a, a high input, I get a low output. It's completely legal. Now, if I have a low input here, the output is going to be high, therefore z is going to the voltage of z is going to be greater than v high. Everything good. So gr what I wrote here in green is a completely valid situation, and it seems to function well. I insert a 1, I output a 0, I get a 1. Everything is good. Now let's introduce noise. So suppose I have here some noise, n of t, which is added to the signal from the output of the first inverter until it enters the second inverter. This is my noise. And let's assume that the noise is big. Bigger than this epsilon prime. That means that v low minus epsilon prime plus the noise is greater than v low. That means that the value which is input to the second inverter does not have a digital interpretation of zero. It is probably not logical. And then we can say nothing about the value of z. So the noise rendered this circuit useless. Okay. So we must strengthen the digital abstraction, for otherwise we cannot even connect two inverters in series. Okay. So we have to deal with noise. And in order to deal with noise, we interpret input signals and output signals differently. <coughs> so what is an input signal? It's a signal measured at the input of a gate. What's an output signal? It's a signal measured at the output of a gate. Instead of using two thresholds, low and high, you will use four thresholds. Two thresholds for low, two thresholds for high. Two thresholds for an output, two thresholds for an input. So, V low out will be less than V low in, which be less than V high in, which be less than V high out. Let's see it on a graph. The x-axis is time. The y-axis is our signal, the voltage. We mark here the four thresholds we have. V low out, V low in, V high in, V high out. Okay? And this is my analog signal. When it's below V low out, I will say that its digital interpretation is a logical zero for an output. When it's below V low in, I will say that the signal is has a digital interpretation of a zero for an input. So I am more strict with respect to outputs than I am with respect to inputs. And the same thing I have with outputs. If the value of the voltage is higher than V high for outputs, I will regard it as a logical one for outputs. If it is higher than V high in, I will regard it as a logical one for inputs. So again, 
I'm stricter for outputs than I am for inputs. Now, how does this help me, the fact that I have these four thresholds? So, when I have a uh, an analog signal, f in of t, where f in is an input, I compare it to v low in and v high in. If it's less than v low in, the digital interpretation is a zero. If it's higher than v high in, the digital interpretation is a one. If it's in between, I'll say it's non-logical. For an output signal, I will use the thresholds of an output, v low out and v high out. Okay, So I am stricter over here than I am over here. Okay, I have two different interpretations, one for inputs, the other one for outputs. Now, let's call the differences between V low in and V low out, and V high out and V high in, let's call them noise margins. Okay, so on the graph, the noise margin is the difference between these two thresholds and the difference between th these two thresholds, and let's assume that these two differences are the same. Now I have a wire. The wire on one end is has an analog voltage of f of t, and on the other hand, end has an analog value of g of t. And let's assume that f is an output. So this is an output. And let's assume that this is an input. Okay? Good. So, g of t is f of t plus the noise that it accumulates when it travels along the wire. So, this is the noise. And let's assume that the noise has an absolute value, which is less than the noise margin. Then, if f of t has a digital, a logical value, then the digital interpretation of g of t equals the digital interpretation of f of t. So if I have a zero here, I'll have a zero here. If I have a one here, I'll have a one here. This is exactly what we would like to have, right? We don't want to have a zero travel, accumulate noise, and become one, or become non-logical. Okay, so let's try to prove a claim. F is an output. So the interpretation of F, if it's zero, it means that F is below the threshold of of an output, the low threshold of an output. What can we say about g of t? g of t equals f of t plus n of t. f of t is less than v low out, and n of t is less than the noise margin. The noise margin is v low in minus v low out. So I can replace n of t by this difference. Now, the v low out cancels with the v low out, and I'm left with the v low in. Namely, g of t is less than v low in. So if I have a zero coming from an output of a gate, the input to another gate will be also zero. Okay? And the case where the digital interpretation of f as an output is one is analogous. Okay. So now we're ready to define our inverter. Consider a device G with one input X, one output Y. The device is an inverter if its static transfer function satisfies the following. If X is below the threshold for inputs with the low, low threshold, then the output Y is higher than the high threshold for outputs. If X is greater than the high threshold for inputs, then Y is less than the low threshold for outputs. Okay, And this distinction between inputs and outputs is applied to other gates as well. Inverter is just a very simple example, because it has a single input and a single output. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's go back to the zero noise model, just to simplify the discussion. This is a case in which no noise is accumulated along wires. We say that a signal is logical at time t if its digital interpretation is 0 or 1. We say that a signal is stable 
during the interval t1, t2, if f of t is logical for every t. Now, if an analog signal f of t is stable during the interval t1, t2, then one of the following holds. Throughout the interval, its digital interpretation is 0, or throughout the interval, its digital interpretation is 1. It cannot have two different logical values within the interval if it is stable. Okay. What is the reason? The reason is the continuity of f of t. f of t is a measurement of voltage over time, and we said that this is a continuous function, and the two thresholds are separated, so it cannot skip below v low and go to v high without passing in the middle, and then its digital interpretation would be non-logical. Okay. So, now think of x of t as a digital signal, namely its values are 0, 1, and non-logical over time. Okay? We say it's logical at time t if x of t is either 0 or 1. We say it's stable if it's stable during the interval, namely x of t is logical for every t be between t1 and t2. This is stability of digital signals, which is of course derived from the stability of the corresponding analog signal. Let's summarize. We describe signals which are either analog and digital, and a digital signal is in fact an interpretation of an analog signal. Noise. We describe the bounded noise model and the zero mo noise model, and we showed how we can interpret analog signals as digital signals. And this is actually the point where we explain why it is said that computers operate over 0 and 1. Because in the stable states, we interpret the analog signals using digital signals, and the values of these digital signals in the stable state is going to be either 0 or 1. We describe what a transfer function is. This is a way of making a relation between the outputs of a device and its inputs. We have a definition of a gate using a transfer function, and we define what stable and logical signals are. Thank you very much.